Family Law, this is your podcast for weeks 12 and 13. We're going to talk about spousal support and the division of marital property. I gave you some reading and then also direct you to the Illinois statutes, which at this point in time, you're more than competent to go find, read, and understand the application as it applies in this instance to a post-divorce proceeding. We're going to talk a little bit about the origins of spousal support, the shift from permanent alimony to rehabilitative support or that focus, how those awards are determined, enforcement mechanisms, how income from support payments are treated. And then we'll talk about marital property, the basic systems and property distribution in that process. And some of that I've touched on in other weeks. So spousal support is called alimony most everywhere else and before no fault reform we talked back when we talked about divorce initially about how illinois used to have grounds and we moved away from that but before that alimony uh, remains linked to determinations of fault the idea of alimony as to forms of damages was um it was beginning to lose hold but it was it was focused in that way. The concept of alimony was highly gendered. In most states, alimony could only be awarded to, or could not be awarded to husbands, it would only be awarded to, um, to wives. And so, very gendered. Um, and, and that was exclusive of whether or not the, there was a great disparity. And you know, it was really on those, in, in those cases, only in those cases where, say, someone was the female of the couple was making five, ten times what the male was making. It just wasn't the norm. And it was typically permanent and incorporated an assumption of um, a belief that females were economically dependent on males. Well, we know that's not true, and so the law evolved with society. Um after, as we moved away from fault to the place we are now and the place we all know we're at in Illinois, property division became the preferred way to adjust the post-divorce economic rights of the parties. Um, and the focus of spousal support shifted from moral to economic considerations. It's now a gender-neutral concept and no longer premised on an assumption that uh, married women are financially dependent or capable of self-support, and we know that's that's true. The other thing I want to emphasize is that property division became pref the preferred way to adjust these economic rights of the parties. And we'll talk about that, and we have talked about that. And at this stage, as I mentioned when we're talking about child support, um, it's really a matter of, uh, you know, negotiation with with these things and there can be a lot of give and take and it can be dependent on you know certain elements of property uh, it's not clear cut it's not necessarily something that is left to a judge or the law to decide a lot of times it's based on many other factors and negotiated um, and the court will generally you know, go along with whatever the people negotiate for whatever reason, so long as it's just not patently unfair, you know, very on its face unfair to one part of you or the, un the other or unconscionable. So that's kind of the background. Um, when we're looking at spousal support or alimony, the factors that come into play, the financial need of the parties, the earning potential of the parties, the age of the parties. Now let's be realistic, the age of the parties. So someone who's, who's married for 26, 30 years and gets a divorce is older. For those of you who are younger, you'll find out that your earning potential doesn't increase after a certain point. In fact, you're, they, they look to get you off the salary rolls and would like you to go out to pasture. Um, and so that's not always true. The duration of the marriage, the longer you're married, the 
more likely you're going to have a larger spousal support expectation. Physical and mental health, which can sometimes coincide with length of marriage and age. Income and financial resources. Um, you know, what are the income and financial resources of either party? What was the marital standard of living? Just as we discussed when we talked about child support and this um, consideration of the court when we're talking about child support, that we don't want the children necessarily to have to have this huge change in their expectations or their, their um, standard of living or how they lived. Um, and sometimes that's not always possible. It's not always possible here too. The court will consider and, and the, the negotiations will consider the marital standard of living. And then the contribution to the marriage, which, you know, that's a little bit more subjective, right? Um, who, who puts the toilet paper, new toilet paper roll on or who makes sure you have toilet paper? Um, who was, was responsible? We have kids. You know, who's responsible for the care of the kids? We've talked about that when we dealt with responsibility and all the time and all that. That come, becomes a factor. But who's been the primary caregiver of the family? Who's been the primary person who takes care of the house? Which aspects of the house? So what are the contributions um, to the marriage to the, those kind of factors? The typical support models um, would be permanent alimony, which is, as it sounds, permanent. It would mean, you know, and for the rest of the life of that person who was to receive or the person who was to pay, and as long as one or the other or both are alive, then it would continue to be expected. If the person who was to pay died, it doesn't happen anymore, obviously, because they can't make those payments. And if the person who is to receive it passes away, it, it ends there as well. A lump sum um, support, or so a lump sum agreement, some some amount that someone is able to to take to essentially say this is what I'm taking as spousal support, and I waive all other expectations. Or rehabilitative, which is probably the norm in a lot of situations that aren't long-term marriages and where people still have time to work, etc. And rehabilitative looks more to um, some of those factors we just discussed, like age, ability to earn income, jobs available, you know, all, all of those things, mental and physical health. And it seeks to, um, for instance, to give someone who hasn't been in the workforce for a while or maybe in the workforce at a um, at a level or in a position that doesn't allow them to sustain a certain quality of life to go out and get their degrees or to update their certificate certifications or to find employment that is more suitable. I'll give you an example of, um, I had a, a client at one point who, um, had been a teacher who was a few de uh, hours short of a master's degree, had been a specific type of teacher with certifications in an area that at the time of the divorce was sought, um, but she didn't have the certifications and she was a little short on her master's degree. Marriage was long term, it was over 20 years. Um, she essentially, when her kids were born, stayed home with the kids, substitute taught for a while, but then just let everything kind of lapse and stayed home with the kids. So at the time of the divorce, her employability you know, was sort of limited. So um, the spousal support was geared towards rehabilitative support, towards um, providing a certain amount until such time as she both uh, earned her master's degree and then updated her certifications. And the master's degree was important because in the time she was away from that field, that became the norm. So with a, to get the jobs that she, you know, was, was wanting or that she uh, would be able to support herself and, uh, with, she needed the master's degree. So it allowed her to get the master's degree, to update her certifications, which she did. And then once she went back to work, that amount was reduced for a period of time. Uh, the reduction eventually ended up being worked out on a, on a lump sum 
based on some other property that they have had and a, an agreement to essentially allow her to have more of that property, real estate. So that's, um, you know, how rehabilitative might work as an example. Now the community property approach, um, shifting gears to property distribution, the community property approach that you've read about, it assumes that each spouse acts for the benefit of the marital unit. The contributions of each spouse to the marriage is counted and each spouse is entitled to share in the financial gains of the marriage. And then on divorce, community property is subject to a division based on a theory of co-ownership without regard to who contributed more, who earned more, who brought the asset into the, into the marriage. Um, historically, common law, the common law approach, states that we divide property according to title. So the spouse who owned an asset was entitled to it at the divorce. Um, so in real, if we go back to our discussion about Hewitt versus Hewitt, remember Hewitt versus Hewitt, the people who weren't married, but thought she, she at least thought that she was. And, and then come to find out they weren't married. The court wasn't going to allow them to, or allow her to use the divorce statute for spousal support and marital property distribution. And then at the end of the day, the house and the cars and the bank accounts were in his name. So they were titled in his name. That's essentially what it would be only with two people were married. Um, and it acknowledges that the accumulation of marital assets derives from the efforts of, of, of both spouses. We don't follow that process. We are more of a community property or modified community property approach. Um, when we're looking at property distribution under our statute, and I know you've read that statute, it comes back to some things that we've talked about prior, and you probably talked about by now in Will's Trust in the States a few times. Um, First, we define the property. And if you remember, the two types of property, real or personal. Real property, not to be confused for those of you who have my evidence class, real evidence. A real evidence is something tangible, something you can hold, touch. Real property, in this sense, refers to land or things affixed to the land. That's it. Real property, land, or things affixed to that land, like a house, um, permanently affixed, I should say. A swing set or something that can be moved would not be permanently affixed. Um, anything other than real property is personal. So every bit of anything else, right, is personal, including money, investments, etc., so the first thing we do is define the property. Is it real or personal? Now that's important because uh, certain types of property require certain types of transfer by ownership. Certain types of property come with more considerations of one of our other um, considerations in this discussion, and that's equity and debt. So we define the property and in these types of situations, ideally, you would help the lawyer get an inventory of all the property, real and personal, and then start determining values. And if you can determine values easy enough, great. And if we can't, we can get appraisers if we have to, but we determine values. Uh, then we look at classification or ownership. So a house, for instance, is the house held as joint tenants, meaning that both parties to the marriage are equal owners of the house. Is that how cars, bank accounts, how are these things held? Are they in one person's name or in both individuals' names? Now, if they're in one person's name, it doesn't necessarily mean that that one person will be entitled to all of that asset, but we want to be able to classify who owns these assets. Um, the thing I just mentioned 
the third element, valuation. How, how do we value these things? Some things you can guesstimate pretty easy. For instance, if you went to uh, Zillow.com uh, and you looked at Zillow.com and you pulled up your address, where you live, it will give you, I think they call it a Zestimate, of uh, the value of that real estate. Now, is that accurate? Because one of the things you have to keep in mind is the value of something is, at the end of the day, what you're able to receive for it. And that, using a house as an example, becomes a big issue um, in divorces because Zillow might say your house is worth $150,000 and you might think it's worth $150,000. Your soon-to-be ex-spouse might think it's worth $180,000. But the market at the time, the only offers you're getting on a house for sale is $120,000. So what's the value of the house? You know, arguably it's it's the 120, what you can sell it for. Those become issues. Um, so value can be speculative. Uh, same thing with vehicles. If you've had the need to obtain or, or trade or deal with vehicles in the last couple of years, especially values are all over the place. You know, depending on what the vehicle is, where it's available, what year it is, all that kind of stuff. And it's been crazy. So we can't get appraisals. We can do our best. But just know that about the value of something. Now, the value of a bank account, say a savings or checking account, is what's in there. Right? That's the value. That's It's a little more known. Um, but the value of a lot of personal property is... Speculative and the value of real property can be speculative as well. And then we talk about distribution. And distribution comes down to uh, several different things and it's negotiated. And, you know, the first things that we have to do is when you're, you're making out this list of real and personal property and the classification of ownership and the, the values, your other column would be equity and debt. So for instance, on that $150,000 house, how much is owed and how much is equity? You figure out how much is owed and you'll know how much is equity. So for instance, if the mortgage on that $150,000 house is $120,000, that means that you have $120,000 debt on that property and you have $30,000 equity. So if you go back to my example where one party thinks it's worth 150 and the other thinks it's worth 180 the only thing you can get out of it when you put it up for sales 120 well your mortgage is going to be paid off and the parties won't have that debt hanging over their head because just because you get divorced doesn't mean that you're not going to have that debt but somebody's expectations are off by thirty thousand dollars and somebody's expectations are off by uh what sixty thousand dollars right okay um here's some realistic things there to think about and some of you may have lived this or been part of this as a child or something you have to move um if you can sell that that house for 180 and you can pay off the 120 thousand dollars debt then the two parties would split the equity or the sixty thousand dollars above what was owed and they each have 30000 to go out and put down on the next house that they're going to live in separately. If it's $150,000 is the selling price, well, now they have 15000 each. You follow me? Um, hopefully that's starting to make sense. Same thing happens with vehicles. So what is the debt on the vehicle? What's the loan on the vehicle? And what is the, the appraised value or what's the value? What could you get? for the vehicle if you sold it outright or traded it in. Um, what is the value? And that again becomes a little more speculative. Where that becomes important is with this reality on those types of items. Vehicles, if you live in central Illinois, you need a vehicle. Most people can't take public transportation to the places they want to uh, get to. And most people that take public transportation would rather have a vehicle because it's kind of difficult to live here and get to all the things that you may need or want to get to without a vehicle. At least 
very challenging. Um, so a vehicle is an example. Say one party wants a particular vehicle and there is a loan on that vehicle. Well, what's going to happen is that the expectation would be that that party assumes that debt um, and it becomes their obligation. On a house, the way it's typically, and, and remember under that circumstance, I'm making the assumption that there's two cars and both parties uh, take a vehicle, okay? Both parties take a vehicle. A lot of times, you know, depending on, unless it's something that's, you know, vehicles that I could never afford and most of us could never afford and it's way out of my realm of even imagination. Um, in most cases for people, it doesn't matter that one person's keeping the old crappy car that's paid off or mostly paid off and the other person's stuck with a huge car payment, but they wanted to keep that car. Um, they're going to be stuck with that car payment because driving a crappy car may cost you more. There's all kinds of variables there. Um, with a house, the, the way it typically works out is that unless both parties want to get rid of the house, and if both parties want to get rid of the house, well then, you know, the debt has to be paid off and they're entitled to whatever equity, so whatever they're able to sell it for above the debt, um, they're entitled to half of that. Unless they negotiate that property towards something else like they could negotiate it towards um, spousal support being offset in some way. But in a lot of cases, someone wants to stay in the house. And we talked about uh, that may be someone who ha is going to have more time and responsibility with the children because of however that works out. In those circumstances, there can be some various trade-off that all gets negotiated regarding someone's equity. So assuming, say, that there's um, 120 owed on the house, and let's say that they agree that there's 150 in equity. Well, the party who's not going to stay in the house is entitled to that $15,000 in equity. Um, they're also responsible still for the debt on the house. It all gets worked out. It's math. It gets negotiated. Um, if it's real clean, if the house is paid for, right? Or if there's a low debt, it's very clean, a lot cleaner anyway. And then you can start negotiating, say, for spousal support of, you know, okay, well, I'll give up 80% of my equity in the house for no spousal support or flip that. Um, and so essentially, you know, one party walks away and doesn't get as much and the other party only has to have a limited loan to pay that other party whatever their equity is. Um, that can be a little cleaner. Hopefully this is kind of being more clear to you that it's this analysis. What is the property, real or personal? And you need to make a list. What are the properties your client owns um, or they have in the marital home, real or personal, all of the real or personal, what's the classification of ownership, who owns it in what way, joint tenants, however it is. Get the documentation on that. Get, get you know, um, copies of deeds or look it up on, a, for instance, Peoria County GIS. Um, valuation, what are the values of all those things? You can appraise it, you can guesstimate, but try to have a ballpark. And then distribution, where you have to consider what's the equity versus debt. And then once you have all that, you can start negotiating or talking about opportunities to negotiate things like um, spousal support. And all of it comes together, as I've used this term in the past, one ball of wax. Um, the thing that becomes interesting is when you think you have things lined up and you think one person wants to stay in the house and you've done all that math and the math is what it is 
and you think that's going to be handled in that manner and that impacts spousal support say because there's an agreement or discussion about spousal support will be accepted at this amount based on what's going to happen with the house and then all of a sudden that individual decides they don't want to keep the house well then it upsets the whole apple cart and everything in it and so the things that you thought would be um, you know settled things that you thought would be done checked off able to move on to other things now you have to re-establish the expectations you have to recalculate how those ex new expectations impact all the other expectations and redo it and that can be frustrating um, all this though can be kind of interesting as well um, and then one final thing to keep in mind because it comes up the longer the divorce goes on the, the more chance that some of these things can um, you know be altered the values for instance can be altered how things are going to be distributed could be altered that's just something you have to live with and and what I mean by that is so you, early on you're going to want to define the property as real or personal and get your list of all the property and then you're going to want to classify it, and you're going to want to start to get appraisals and values and then you're going to want to understand what the equity and the debt is but you know you can have different things that occur the longer this divorce goes on like I mentioned the car market you know values plummet housing market they plummet or Maybe they go crazy and that causes somebody who thought they wanted the house to say, no, let's just cash it out and I'll take the money. Um, there's all kinds of variables there. And, and I think the main point to remember is something we talked about weeks and weeks ago now that once we got here, um, we discussed it. It's that whole ball of wax. This now goes into negotiations and who takes what property or who wants what property is impacted by other considerations that include um, you know the whole discussion of, of spousal support um, equity debt you know how things are going to be transferred how long somebody's going to contribute or not contribute and all of that so I hope this helps you with this particular set of topics Again, this is for weeks 12 and 13, and so you can come back to this and re-listen in week 13. If you have any questions, you know you can reach out to me. And as always, if you need me, you know where to find me.